morning. We're going to open a word of prayer. We're glad that you're with us this morning. We're going to pray as we do uh, just about every Sunday for another church in our community. If I can find that list, we're going to pray for one of our churches down in Panama. And then a couple of our monthly supportive missionaries and church families. And uh, we're just going to invite the presence of the Lord to join with us this morning. Would you join me in a word of prayer this morning? Father, thank you for this day and opportunity to, to gather together to worship you. And uh, God, we just pray that in this setting here in our church building, that your spirit would be free to roam and move and speak into hearts and lives. And pray for those who will be watching live stream this morning or the late broadcast this afternoon. Those who listen to the podcast at a later point. In every setting, Lord, in every setting, that your spirit would move, that the hearts would be open, receptive to your voice, to your word, and allow it to grip their hearts, grip our hearts. That the cause is to be transformed ever closer to the image of Christ. Lord, we pray this morning for Pastor Larson and Christ King Lutheran Church. I just pray your blessing on their service today as they worship together, as they minister in this community, that you will use Christ King, Lord, to, to touch the lost and to meet the needs of the hurting in this community. Use them in just a powerful way. We pray your blessing on every aspect of their church life. God, that as they, as they reach out with the message and the hope of Christ, that you will empower and use them. We think of our churches in Panama, Lord, I pray for the Darien campus today. And, and uh, while they're not meeting in person yet, uh, they're meeting in a variety of ways. And we just pray that you will minister through that congregation, through the food distribution network that they're a part of, and all of the things that are happening in ministry, that you will continue to use them in reaching the lost people of Panama. Lord, we just pray for the country as they battle just, a, just an increasingly difficult time with this COVID. And we just pray for healing and restoration of all this in lives of families today. We think of our monthly supported missionaries. We pray for a Lake Geneva Christian Center. And uh, the things that are happening, beginning to happen in the campgrounds again, Lord, that, uh, that your spirit will continue to move, that you're not inhibited because of the limited numbers and all of those things, but that you'll continue to use the campgrounds and the various things that will happen there this year. To reach people with the message of Christ, to fill them with your Holy Spirit, to call them the ministry at whatever level that would be for them. That, that people will continue to hear and feel your presence and know your voice. Well, we think of the Millsaps and their work in, in the Baltics, and particularly in Lithuania. And, and Lord, we just pray your blessing on that ministry as they oversee church planting throughout the Baltic region. Uh, strengthen, encourage, bless them, we pray. And we pray for church family members today. I pray for Pastor Cheryl. Lord, I just pray your blessing in her life and, and the ministry that she continues to do and then recording and teaching lessons for people in Panama and other, other things she's involved with in meeting and visiting the people from our congregation. Give her wisdom, give her insight, strength, and encouragement, Lord. We pray as well for the Kravitz today, for David and Paulette. We pray your blessing on their marriage, on their home, Lord, on the business. Everything that they do would be marked with your favor and your presence. We pray for the, for the kids as well, for Wyatt and Reagan and Walker, Lord, that these young people will be used of you and, and sharing their faith, the hope in Christ that they've experienced with those of, those of their circle of influence. And Lord, again, we just want to commit our time together to you, that everything that is said and done today would bring honor and glory to you and would draw us closer to you. And speak to us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name.
Jesus. The more we come to that sweet nectar, the more energy we have, the more fulfilled we will be. Come to Jesus, the sweet nectar, over and over and time and time. Fill up, fill up that sweet nectar.
And so God was speaking back to my heart as I was thinking about Terrence. And I'm familiar with his ministry and school ministry and school ministries and school uh, programs for high schools and junior highs. And I've talked about that in the last few weeks. And so we, I just felt like that's what we wanted to do. And so then, then I also know that Terrence does some incredible comedy stuff. And I said, you know, we'll have a preach in the morning and do some comedy stuff in the afternoon. And, and then over the course of the next several days, the Lord just took me to the woodshed and spanked me a little bit. <laughs> because, because, and I'll tell you why. Because, because I don't want to bring Terrence in and, and have him speak in the morning and be the entertainer in the afternoon. Because at the end of the day, all we remember is the entertainment. We don't remember that he was the man of God who the Holy Spirit used and anointed and spoke through. We remember the entertainment piece. And we may bring him back at another point for the entertainment piece. But today he's here as the man of God. He's here as the voice of God. We never talk about what he should preach. None of that was, in fact, when he came here this morning, you know, we didn't talk about that. If something wrong to preach, I said, I'll let you preach what the Holy Spirit tells you to preach about. Because that's what I believe that I try to do. I want to, we've been on many times where I've had a message. And then God said, you know what, that's, those are really nice notes, and maybe someday I'll let you preach it, but today I want you to do this. <laughs> and so as we were working through stuff and going on, and somebody looked at me and said, how about, how about this? I suddenly feel like God wants me to speak on this. Is that okay with you? I said, if, I think it doesn't matter if it's okay with me. If God is saying it to your heart, <laughs> then it has to be okay with me. And so I know that's what he's going to share with us this morning. I don't know the, 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 I don't know the text on all those things, but I do know this. He's a man of God who hears from God. And, uh, and we want to hear from God, don't we? Because the yeah. goal of the church is to hear something fresh and new and powerful from God. And so, Terrence, come on, come on down. And, uh, and I think we may have some of those things ironed out that we can use some of that this morning. I think we might be fine to figure it out. And, uh, and the best part for me, listen, this brother's from this guy. <laughs> it's not be an extra plus there, right? <laughs> well, let me let me explain. I am not originally from Wisconsin. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Brad. Uh, it was quite an honor that you reached out because I don't know if you guys know this, and I even know if the mic's on. I just have a loud voice. But, um, obviously, with everything going on, is it on? Nope. Is it on? The Lord is good. Um, obviously, with everything that's happened this uh, year, it was really, really a scary moment in time as an evangelist going out and speaking that when everything hit in March, Everything in my schedule, gone. And it was one of those moments where your heart drops and your worst fear is realized at that point in time. And let me tell you, when you are faced with your worst fear, you pray more than you've ever prayed in your life. And it was one of those things where it's just like month by month, it's like, God, you have to show up. If you do not show up, I am in trouble. And it was so cool, just as everything was coming down, uh, Pastor Brad, he just gave me a call, and it's just, I would love to have you come. And it was one of those things where, literally, now after the last few weeks, I finally started getting more stuff on my schedule, but your guys' pastor and his wife, they were the ones to open the door for all that to happen. Amen. And so, can you guys help me and just give me, uh, your pastor's a big round of applause. <laughs> So, with that, uh, a couple of different things. Um, number one, once again, my name is Terrence Talley, and I get the awesome privilege to be able to travel around and not only go to churches, but also to go to public schools as well. And with that, if you guys look out there before you guys came in, you probably saw my table, and with my table, Number one, you'll see uh, our t-shirts, but then you'll also see this book out there as well. Now, I'm not one of those people that's like, yeah, I wrote a book and it's good. I, I do not feel like I wrote this book, okay? It was literally a dream I had, and I was like, God, I don't know what to do. And he was just like, I got you. And so uh, what it is, 
is after I get done with the school assembly, students will write me their secrets, write me things that are going on in their lives. And so what we did is we've taken those secrets from across the country and we put them in a book. And now the whole idea is that somebody can open up the book and they can read someone else's secret. And yeah, uh, not all the details are the same, but you can recognize when someone hurts like you hurt. And if you know someone hurts like you hurt, then you know you're not alone. And if you know you're not alone, then you know there is hope for you. Worst thing about putting this book together, I had over hundreds of secrets to choose from. Hundreds of hurting students and even uh, some parents in this book. Some pretty dark secrets. But we are not called to just stay within our own light, but we are called to bring the light to those darkest places. And that is my goal with this book, and that is what I do. And you guys will learn later on, I am married, I have my wife, her name is Courtney, and she is the smartest person I know, and I don't know why she's married to me, but we all have a lack of judgment sometimes. And then I also have two daughters as well. Uh, my daughter, oh, so is it happening? Oh, oh, I wasn't even expecting that slide. I freaking save it to the end, but yeah. Uh, there's my family. That's my wife, Courtney. And then my two daughters. Uh, the youngest one, her name is Cece. She's actually four now. And my other daughter, Gracie, she's actually seven now. And oh my goodness, Cece is one of the, like my older daughter, Gracie, she's like just right on the oldest. She's responsible. And it's like, man, we're doing a really good job. And then Cece, I don't know what happened with her. She, I feel like she's a child from another planet. And if you guys will, if you go on Facebook and if you're friends with me, you will see a video I posted about my daughter. And we literally, I, I didn't even know how to explain it. This has nothing to do with the sermon, but now you got to go. Uh, literally, we're sitting down at dinner and we do our family devotions during dinner time. And this past uh, two Sundays ago, we're doing our devotion, and the devotion was talking about uh, facing darkness. And so we're talking about how good God is, and we're talking about slavery, slavery, and what that looks like in our world, and what we do as a family. And my daughter got super like I don't even know if excited is the word. She got like angry, but like, uh, I don't know if there's ever like a joyous anger, but that's what she was. And so if you look on my Facebook page, you will see her and she starts going off and she's just like, I want to work for Jesus. And she's like, I want to die. I want to die for Jesus. And she's like super excited. And there's a point where I was just like, I don't know if you went too overboard with serving Jesus or not. But she is excited, and maybe she will be a uh, missionary one day. I don't know, but already at four years old, she's like, I'm going to die for Jesus. And so she's, she's awesome. I love both of our daughters. Um, but with that being said, I've been going back and forth just trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to preach on? And I have one sermon, and I had another. And I, I decided at the last minute... I wasn't going to do uh, this sermon that I was like, maybe this is what uh, God has me for. But at the same time, I think I should just mention it. Uh, and oh, man, you know what? As I'm sitting here right now, I'm just like, God, why do people I'm like bring this up in my head? So you know what? We're gonna do that sermon, okay? We're just we're switching it now, and I don't know why. Hopefully. God knows what he's doing. And so with that being said, uh, we are going to go together. We're going through this together. Matter of fact, turn to the person next to you let them know. We're going through this together. We're going through it together. Now, uh, see, for me, 
One of my favorite things in the world is superhero movies, okay? I love superhero movies. And uh, today, one of the things that, uh, one of the verses I want us to look towards is John 14, 27. And it says this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, I do not give to you as the Lord gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Okay, so, there is a difference in superhero movies, okay? There is, if you guys don't know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to educate you as much as possible. There is, you look very serious right now, I don't know if I can read your mind, but I'm like, you got to just roll with me here for a second. Uh, first, there is DC movies, DC comics, that's Superman, that's Batman, and I'm like, eh, that's okay. But, I am a huge Marvel fan. Marvel Comics fan, and that is Iron Man, that's Captain America, and one of my favorite movies of all time has to be the last Marvel movie that came out, Avengers Endgame. Now, I don't know if, if has anybody seen Avengers Endgame? Okay, I was a little surprised, okay, okay. <laughs> now, if you have not, I'm gonna give a warning. Is there anybody in here that's just like, you know what, Terrence? I think I might go see that movie. Anybody that hasn't seen the movie? Oh, okay. All right, you might have to cover your ears for some of this, okay? So, let me just give you a background for you, okay? So basically, in this movie, uh, the Avengers, these movies have been going on for 10 years, right? And you have these heroes, and they're fighting all these villains and these forces that have come, and, and they're trying to take and take over the planet and everything like that. And so for 10 years, we finally see them doing all this, but then the biggest bad guy of all time comes around, and his name is Thanos. And Thanos, he's like the most powerful villain in the whole entire universe. And the first movie uh, that they have, it's Avengers Infinity War. This guy comes and he collects all these gems that makes them so powerful. And then the, the heroes, they're trying to fight. They're trying to beat this guy that seems unbeatable. And then within the final moments of that movie, and you might want to cover your heart, your ears, <laughs> And the final part where you think maybe, just maybe, the heroes might overtake it, boom! He wipes out half of the universe. All the heroes, half of them, gone. This is how the first movie ends. And you're like, what? How is this possible? They're the heroes. They're supposed to win, right? You can't just end the movie and be like, yeah, bad guys won. Have a good time. Bye. Like, you can't do that. But that is what happens in this movie. But then the second one comes out. And the second one, it is five years later, okay? And five years later, everybody's gotten used to to not having half the people, half the heroes in the universe, but then a very small glimmer of hope appears. Now, I'm not going to go through the movie like beat by beat by beat for you, but there's a glimmer of hope, and they finally, they're able to go, and they're traveling, and they go back in time, and they're trying to end everything. Once again, from your ears. And they get to the point where they're able to face the final villain, Captain America, Iron Man and Thor, they meet the villain at the end, and he's sitting down in the middle of all this destruction. And they're like, okay, we have to fight him. And so they go down, and they have this battle, and this dude is beating up all three of them at once. And then finally, he gets to this point where he has Thor, and Thor is like the god of thunder and everything. Not like big G god, little G god. And he's the god of thunder, and of course, he's got him down on the ground, and he's about to hit him. And Thor, he has this magical hammer, right? Comic books. And he has this hammer, and, and Thor, he's lost it, and now the weapon's about to go into him. But then you see a shot of this hammer starting to lift up. Thor is about to be taken out by the villain, and next thing you know, boom! 
a hammer hits the back of the villain's head, and then all of a sudden, you look, Captain America catches the hammer, and you're like, oh my God, that's that. Like, I literally jumped out of my seat when I saw this. And so he's going back and forth, and Captain America, he's trying to fight this villain by himself. But then the villain gets him. He beats him down to the ground, and he's sitting there. All his army appears behind him, and this looks like it's going to happen again. The villain's going to win. But not this time. Because Captain America, he gets up one last time, and he's ready to face the whole army by himself. But then, behind him, all these heroes start to appear, and they come back from the defeat that they had in the first movie. But now they're coming back, and they come back, and they win. This is what our world needs right now. See, one of the things that I love about this movie is, once again, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Okay, so, the story we're going to look at today, we're going to go to the book of Joshua, okay? Joshua, I think, really, really illustrates this really well. And in the book of Joshua, just a huge background for you, okay? And Joshua, uh, before this starts, you have Moses. And Moses, and anybody seen The Prince of Egypt? Prince of Egypt? And isn't that a great movie? Like, it's an animated movie, but it's just like, oh, God, you're good. And so, uh, in the movie, it showcases everything that happens. See, Moses, he's uh, one of the Egyptian, like, princes, and then, not princesses, that's weird. But uh, he was a prince of Egypt, and then he finds out that he is part of Israel. He's part of the Jewish nation. And so he runs away, and he's scared, and then he's just trying to go along in his normal life. And then God calls him to go back to Egypt and to get all the slaves, all of his people, out and set them free and bring them to the promised land. And so there's this whole thing where he's telling... Uh, Pharaoh, hey, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, I don't think so. And then God's like, you better change your mind. And he does all these like plagues come and all this stuff. And then finally, Pharaoh's like, I can't take this no more. Take your people and get out of here. And so they go and then Pharaoh's like, I gotta kill these people. And he goes after them. But of course, God wins every single time. And so he takes out all of Pharaoh's army. And then finally, Moses and his people are free from Pharaoh. And as they're going, it's time to come to the promised land. And so, God tells them, this is what you need to do. You need to go into this land. And going into this land, I'm going to show you, uh, I need you to send out some spies. And so they send out some spies to check out the land. And then, of course, uh, Caleb and Joshua, they're part of the two spies that go. And then they come back, and they're just like, hey, we saw the land. This is what God wants us to do. But then the other spies, they're like, hey, hold up. These people over there, they are giants. They are big. We look like grasshoppers in their eye, and then they think the same about us. And, and it's one of those things where their fear changes who they think about themselves. And they, at that point, after all the, the rumbling and the yelling amongst each other, God says, that's it. You're not going to the promised land. For the next 40 years, you are just going to toil within the desert and none of you, except for everybody over the age of this certain point, everybody else, you will not be able to go into the promised land. So they struggle for the next 40 years. But then the start of the book of Joshua. And this is where I think one day I'm going to make a movie about this, okay? Because in the book of Joshua, now, for everybody in here, if you are 13, 12 years old, check this out. This is how the beginning of the book of Joshua goes, okay? This is why I want to make a movie about this. It says, 
after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord uh, said to Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. <laughs> Isn't that a cool beginning? It's like, Moses, my servant is dead. Can you imagine, like a movie starts off, and then all of a sudden you have that like awesome voice come in and says, my servant is dead. And you're like, oh, this is going to be epic. And so, the moment of God, he says, Joshua, this is your time. It's your turn. And this will be the point where the people will finally go into the promised land. All right. So, uh, you guys have to understand, for me, uh, I grew up in Farmington, Minnesota, okay? Now, if you do not know Farmington, Minnesota, back in the day, it it did not look like what it did now. It was like a farm, and there was a town around that, okay? And in the town of Farmington, we were the only uh, people that looked like this. I know, sexy. So, <laughs> we would go to school, and we would be the oldest ones, but when I was in second grade, the biggest thing that we had in Farmington, Minnesota, was the school Christmas play. Now, we could be all sorts of different things in the school Christmas play. People, they could be like reindeer, and other people, they could be like little owls, and people could be the like pie fighter playing on the pie fight. I don't know how you would do it, but I'm guessing that's how it's done. And they had all these roles, but I wanted to be Santa Claus. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I would like sit in my mirror, and I would practice my ho-ho-hos. I'd be like, ho-ho-ho, well, I was a little kid, so I probably sounded like, ho, 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 and I was good at it. And then one day, I woke myself up all early in the morning, got dressed, and I knew this was the day I was going to ask my teacher if I could be Santa Claus. So, of course, as I'm going to school, I'm just like, ho, 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 and then finally, I get to school, I walk up to my teacher, I tug on her shirt, and I said, Teacher, I will be Santa Claus. Ho, ho, ho! And then my teacher, she looked at me, and she goes, Terrence, because that's my name, Terrence. Terrence, you can't be Santa Claus because you're black. And at that time, nobody told me there was a difference between white and black. Nobody told me that there are people in this world that are going to treat me differently based off of the way that I look. So the first thing that when she said that, first thing that just popped up in my mind was, oh, we can change that. If Michael Jackson can do it, so can I. And so I went home and I got a bottle of bleach and I put that in the sink and then I got a washcloth and I put that in the sink and then I began to scrub. Now obviously, most of you already know what happens. Because see, if you put bleach on a plant, the plant will die. And if you put bleach on a human being, the human being will scream like they're done. <laughs> and at that point, I learned something. I can't change who I am. And whether it will be your skin color, maybe for some of us, it's our family history, maybe for some, it's income, and maybe just maybe for others, it's something else that you feel powerless about. And it can be pretty scary, and pretty self-defeating. Mm -hmm. yeah. But do not let fear change you. Right. God calls you to go. Yeah. And when we go, we have to go together. I remember one day after that all happened, I came out of my house, second grade Terrence, and I looked and I saw my two older brothers and they were scrubbing something off of our garage. And somebody had written the end of it all right there. And the minute I saw that, fear started to come over me and I didn't know what to do. But then my mom grabbed me and she goes, Terrence, you are never who they say you are. God has already 
have said it. And you just have to walk in that. Don't let them change who you are. This is our time. This is not time for black people. This is not a time for white people. This is a time for God's people. Yes. And if we're going to do this, we have to go together. My mom reassured me that I am not alone in any of this. And one of the cool things that I think about the story of Joshua, God reminded him that he is not alone in any of this either. One of the first things that God asked Joshua to do, and you can see it in Joshua 1, uh, 10. It says, so Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your set, get your supplies ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go and take possession of the land. Now, think about this. Joshua, God's like, all right, it's time, go. And Joshua's like, for real, just go. And so he goes towards his people. And he's like, uh, hey, y'all. We're going to go. And his people are like, we're going to go where? And Joshua's like, I don't know. We're just going to go. And so they packed up their stuff and they went. Sometimes we don't have to know the destination in order for God to still send us to yeah. go. Yeah. We may not know where someplace where God is leading us. We may not know where we might land with everything. But God still says, Go. See, when I think about go, you have to remember the greatest uncertainty is God's greatest activity. See, when you may not know what lies ahead, anytime in the Bible, if you look at all the people that come, when you look at David, and David's like, all right, you're going to go and you're going to defeat this giant. And David, at the time, I'm sure he's like, okay. He's like, I don't know how to do this. I got a slingshot, but let's go. And he goes. And what does he do? He defeats the giant. And, of course, with uh, Elijah, Elijah, God calls him. So a woman, she's just like, I'm going to kill you. He's like, oh, snap. I got to get out of here. And then God's like, no, what are you doing? Why are you hiding? Go. And they may not know what's going to happen, but they step into that. And when we step into a place that maybe we do not know, but we know God is calling us to go forward, it may seem uncertain. But God still says, don't worry. This is when I am able to show how great I am. Is within your uncertainty. Go. And, of course, with everything that has happened, what, I should have asked this before. What, what time do you guys get out? <laughs> you should not say that to a person. <laughs> like, it is noon and we're going to eat right here. No, I'm going to make sure that we do this within a certain time. So when I think about Go, um, I, had, I used to work with an organization called Free International. And so what FREE does, FREE stands for Find, Rescue, Embrace, and Empower. And so what that means is that they fight human trafficking in this country. People don't know, but we have a huge human trafficking problem here. And you can literally buy somebody in this country for $90. And so what FREE does is they go out and they, they go to places and they're, they're fighting human trafficking. And matter of fact, uh, a lot of the people being trafficked in our country is students under the age of 17 years old. And we're not talking about people brought over from different countries. We are talking about American students being sold. And so what Free does is they go and they rescue these students and these people that are being sold. Now, there are two different parts of Free. There is the find and rescue part where people will go in and they'll go to those hotels and they'll work with the FBI and they bust in and they'll save these people. That is not me, okay? Look at me. I am a small dude. That is not me. So I work with the education and prevention side of it. So what we do is we go out and we do school assemblies and we educate uh, these students and tell them, hey, this is the red flags to look for if you're being trafficked. This is what you need to do if you know somebody that's being trafficked. So fast forward one day, I'm, I'm a youth pastor and it's a Monday and all of a sudden I get a message. That's how it sounds to me. And I get a message and it's from this girl that I graduated high school with. 
I hadn't talked to her in like 13 years. And she messages me and she goes, Terrence, do you still work with that organization? And I'm like, uh, yeah. And she goes, I really need help. It's time for me to get out. And I'm like, oh, oh okay. And I'm like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. If you give me your information, I'm going to give it to my friends and my friend. They're going to help get you out of your situation. And she was like, okay. And so she gave me the information. I sent it to my friends that are part of the find and rescue portion. And I was like, okay, my job is done. This is great. I've done my good deed. Now, Wednesday comes. I'm about to set out. I'm about to go on stage to go preach. Next thing I know, I get a message from my friend that works for free. And he goes, Terrence, he was like, there is no one around you that can go and rescue this girl. You're going to have to go and get her. And I go, whoa, I'm like, you don't understand. That's not my job. I don't just go and rescue people. I can't do this. And he's like, Terrence, she only has a small window of time that she is able to leave and get out of this situation. We need you to go. And so at this point, I'm like, okay, I, I gotta think. I was like, I need some help. And so I was like, you know what? Uh, the biggest person at my church at that time was this guy named Mike Lee. Mike Lee, not only was he tall, Mike Lee was like big. And so I was like, Mike, can you go with me? I need your help to go rescue a girl out of human trafficking. And he's like, let's go. And so we jumped in the car. And my friend's on the phone, he's like, okay, this is where you need to go, travel, travel, travel. And you also have to understand, I lived in Minneapolis for most of my life. I know Minneapolis, backward, in, out, I know the city. We turned this corner, and it was a corner I had never been a part of. And I was like, ooh, this is, this is kind of scary right now. And so uh, we get there, and my friend goes, okay, now, I want you to look around. Do you see a green van? I go, yeah. He goes, is there anybody in that green van? I go, uh, no, not that I can see. And he's just like, okay, because if there's somebody in there, that means they're the person that's watching everything. And if they catch you, you could possibly get killed. And at this point, I'm starting to get nervous. And I'm like, <laughs> this sounds dangerous. It almost sounds like I should have brought a gun. And he goes, did you? I go, did I? And I looked at Mike and I go, did we? He goes, we sure did. I was like, oh, okay, we're ready. And he's like, all right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to drive your car in front of this apartment building. And this apartment building, it didn't look like an apartment building I had ever seen. Because the door, it had like a metal sheet right on there. And each and every window was kind of like, and, and he goes, okay, you're going to drive and you're going to park your car. Don't even park, he goes. Just stop and have your foot on the brake because if you need to go, you need to be ready to go at any moment. And he goes, I want you to wait here and then when the time comes, Hillary's going to come up. I probably should have said her name, erase that. But when the time comes, she's going to come out and she's going to jump in your car and you just need to go. And I'm like, okay, okay. And he goes, if anybody else comes out of that door, leave. And we're sitting there, and he goes, make sure you're constantly looking behind you, because you don't know who's sneaking up on you. So I'm sitting here, and I'm like, <laughs> constantly going, and then all of a sudden, the door opens up, and this old lady comes walking out. When I say old, I mean like 95. <laughs> and when she comes out, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's an old lady! He goes, parents, calm down, it's an old lady. And I'm like, okay. And she comes up and she's carrying this uh, basket full of dirty clothes and she puts them in her car. And then next thing you know, the girl comes running out. She jumps in the back of the car and I hear my friend go, 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 go. And we just drive off. Come to find out, my friend had been trapping ever since high school. And I didn't even know. And she only had a small window of time because the person that held her captive, he just happened to be going out to eat at that certain point, and that was the only time she was able to leave. And so as we're driving, uh, my friend and I were trying, uh, I didn't know what to say to her because I hadn't seen her for years, and so we started to talk, and I go, why did you reach out to me? And she goes, it's 
symbol. Every single time that I saw you on social media, I saw you with people that just seemed happy. I saw you with people that you went to church with, and she thought, maybe, just maybe, if he's constantly hanging around good people, and maybe he's a good person still, too. It was the people that I were with. It was bringing Mike Lee with me that in the face of all uncertainty, there was somebody that needed to be rescued. And if we wouldn't have gone together to go do it, then who knows if she would have been rescued that night. We need to go. Because just like Paul says, we're fighting a battle. And this battle is not a physical battle, but it's a battle uh, against a sort of spiritual battle. It's spirits. And if we don't do this together, we're going to lose. So we have to go together on this. And the next part is Joshua. And I encourage everybody, if you've never read Joshua, read it. I'm skipping a whole bunch of parts, but it's really cool. Now, they get to this point, and we'll go to Joshua 4. And Joshua chapter 4, they get to this part where they finally get to the river, and just like uh, the way that God opened it up for Moses, he does the same thing. And so he parts the water, and then he's able to walk through him and the army. And then once they walk through, Joshua goes, okay, we need to get some stones, and we need to mark what God has done. We have to have a sign to remember so that when the time comes, maybe generations from now, maybe in a couple weeks from now, we're going to need to remember what God did. Because if you don't remember, then you sometimes forget how powerful of a God we serve. So, a sign from God is always a sign to remember. As we go forward in this new day and age, and, and maybe it's something that's going on with the virus, maybe it's something uh, happening within uh, the racial things that are happening, we have to remember that there's good. We have to remember that God, he brought his people together once, and he's going to do it again. And we want to be a part of what God does. So we have to remember what he did. And then, all of a sudden, within the final, before they go and take the, the city, Joshua, uh, God goes, okay, what you're going to do, and we'll go to uh, chapter 6, and we'll go to verse 15. Uh, God, he's just like, all right, Joshua, here's what I want you to do. You're going to go out, and you're going to walk, march around the city, and you're going to do this for seven days, and you guys, you're all in your army, and your people, and you're just going to march, and you're not going to say anything. Just march around the city. I mean, can you guys imagine? You're just sitting there in your town, and you just see people just walking every single day around. You'd be like, okay, this is messed up. This is like some children of the corn and stuff. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and you'd be really scared. And, well, it's an 80s movie. Watch it. Don't watch it. It's very dark. Don't watch it. <laughs> and so, they're walking around the city, and then on the seventh day, God says, all right, this is the time that you're going to take the city. And he goes, I want you to blow the trumpets. And so in verse uh, 16, it says, The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the city walls come down. And they go in. What does it say for us during this time even now? We march together. If we march together, we have to go, we have to remember what God has done, and we have to march together. This is how we win battles. This is how we become the fearless people of God that we are. You can't be fearless by yourself. You need to come to, with other people. This, every single time in the Bible, God always brings that person with other people. God set David up with people. God set Elijah up with people. God
God is constantly saying, you have to march together with my people. Remember, in John, um, 4, John 14, 27, it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. See, Jesus, he was just like, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to leave you with the comfort. I'm going to leave you with my peace. And what does the world give us sometimes? Or the world, it gives us grief. It gives us fighting. It gives us uh, depression, suicide. The world, that is what it's going to give us. But God says, my peace, it will give you something. My peace I'm going to give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid going forward. Um, so, I got to be honest with you guys. There was, it was a couple days ago, I was with uh, some speakers from around the country. And these speakers from around the country, uh, we got together and we started talking. And they're white uh, speakers, black speakers, like these speakers literally came from across the country and there's this other guy that came, he's some really weird, unknown guy named Reggie Dabbs, he came to <laughs> and we were, some of you guys were like, I have no idea who it is, don't worry, I'm better about that. So, we were all in this place together and the issue of race came up and I was trying to stay quiet, and I was just trying to stay out of it, but they pulled me up, and they were like, Terrence, we need you to pray. And I couldn't. And I was so angry at that point of time that all of a sudden, I lost it. I started bawling. I started talking about the things that my, my family has experienced. I started to talk about how sometimes there are kids in our neighborhood that don't want to play with my daughter because of the way she looks. I started saying, this is not fair. But then I took out this toothbrush, a washcloth, and a dime. If you guys don't know, um, Martin Luther King Jr., every single time before him and his people were going to go march, they would give them a washcloth, a toothbrush, and a dime. See, the toothbrush was for when, if they were to go to jail, then they would at least have a toothbrush to brush their teeth. And they would give them the dime so they could make a phone call to somebody to help get them out of jail. But then they would give them a washcloth. They would give this to them so that if they got bloody and bruised, they would have something to wipe each other's blood off of. They handed this to me and they said, Terrence, we're in this together. Mm -hmm. And you're my brother. So if you hurt, I hurt. We will take care of each other. Mm -hmm. This to me represents God's peace. And I don't know where you're at. And, and maybe this has nothing to do with anything that's racial. Maybe you're going through a time right now where you just are scared. You're dealing with something. I am telling you right now, you're with God's people. We march together. And when we march together, we conquer together. Um, there was this school I was at one time, and I'll never forget it. Uh, usually, then I talk about dad hugs, and if you don't know what a dad hug is, dad hug says, I love you, and you don't have to do anything for me. Dad hug says, I think you're great, and 
You don't have to be the superstar athlete. You don't have to get straight A's. I just think you're great because you're you. Uh, I give that out uh, because I want students to know that someone loves them. And so we're at the school, and I remember I'm up standing up with the students where I all sit down on a chair, and I start to talk about the importance of a dad hug. And then all of a sudden, in the front row, this girl begins to cry. Now, I'm usually, I'm pretty, like, that's a pretty normal thing for people to cry when I talk because, because I'm a sad preacher. <laughs> but the more I start going, the louder and louder this girl's cries are. Until it got to the point where she's not even crying anymore. She's just wailing. She's just like, Wah! And everybody's like, oh my gosh. I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is really weird. And at this point, I don't know what to do. I'm trying to ignore it. This is a public school. So I'm just trying to just keep going with what I'm supposed to do. And in the midst of that, I kid you not, I heard God go, Terrence, you need to give this girl dad love right now. And I'm like, okay, God, I'll give it to her after I get done. And he goes, no, you need to give this girl a hug right now. I'm like, right now? He's like, right now. I don't know if you've had an argument with God, but you're going to lose every time. <laughs> and so I look at the crowd and I go, hey, I'm sorry. I have to do something real quick. And I got down and put the mic in my pocket and I bent down to her. And I go, hey, I don't know what's going on right now, but I do know I'm here because I love you. I love you like a dad should love their daughter. And if you don't mind, I would love to give you a dad hug. Is that okay? And she goes, oh, God. And so she stands up and she grabs me and I'm like hugging her and she's hugging me. And we're sitting there and we're like hugging for like 30 seconds. Now some of you are like, oh, 30 seconds, that's not that long. Trust me, when everybody's looking at you, 30 seconds is a very long time. And so at this point, I'm like, okay, girl, you gotta sit down, I have to finish this. And so she sits down, I finish the assembly, and then all of a sudden, when I am talking to somebody after the assembly is done, this girl runs over to me, grabs me by the shirt, twists me around, and goes, you have no idea what you did. You have no idea. What, what's going on? And she goes, earlier this year, my friend went to a church event and she gave her life to Jesus. And every single day since then, she has asked me to go to church with her. But I told her, I don't believe in God. Because what kind of God would allow my dad to abuse my mom? What kind of God would allow my dad to abuse me. And she goes, this morning I got up, I saw my dad push my mom to the ground, and he picked up his bag, and he left out of our house, probably for the last time. And she goes, I ran back in my room, and I was so angry that I threw things on the ground, I broke everything in my room, and she goes, I even yelled at God, and I said, God, if you're real, you will show me that I am loved uh, like a daughter should be loved by their dad. Oh. And she goes, and you wow. hugged me. You told me you love me like a dad should love their daughter. She goes, I don't know if you believe in God, but I just gave my life to him right there. <laughs> this is what we do. We do not judge. We just go in a public school. This girl got Jesus. And it was all through the love. That's it. That's what we are called to do. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to pray. Matter of fact, you know what? I'm going to pray right now. Um, God, we just come before you, and God, you are truly amazing. And during this time, I pray for everybody in this room. I pray for the people that feel like they have no answers. Lord, I pray that you will comfort them, and you will let them know I have the answers for you. Lord, I pray for the people in this room that, that might be uh, a little afraid during this time, 
Lord, I pray your hand comes upon them and go, don't worry, I am going to guide your steps. Lord, I pray for the people in here that may have some anger, that are dealing with some things, maybe some shame that they have, from the things that they have done. Lord, I pray that you will come to them and you'll let them know, I love you. I still call you. And I am here to give you my peace. No matter where we're at, Lord, we just need you. So I pray that you will meet each and every person where they are at. And I God, that they will have a moment that is not uh, from the pulpit, but it's just with you and from you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a lot of what I do when uh, we're in the schools. And matter of fact, I work with an organization called uh, Stand for Truth. And instead of me telling about, I don't know if we have the video on it, it was right before a picture of my family, but if we could play that real quick, that would be great. <laughs> Basically, what stands for truth, what we do is we go into the schools and we go to uh, public schools and we come in there with a band and everything and we invite them back uh, for a concert that night. And at that concert, that's when we're able to present a gospel and give a altar call during that time. And let's go to the next slide. Next slide. <laughs> Once again, beautiful people. All right, so uh, at the assembly, there are lots of things that happen. There are a lot of different stories uh, that come through that. You guys have heard a couple of those today. And it's been a really, really awesome experience. Next slide. Uh, the concert at night, tons of students. Uh, matter of fact, I've gotten an opportunity to speak even before everything happened. This year, I had spoken to over 100,000 students, and I saw just about 435 students uh, come to know Jesus, which I saw with my own eyes. Uh, so it's, it's been a really awesome experience. Next slide. And so afterwards, uh, we work with the local churches, and they're able to do follow-up with them and invite them to church and everything. Next slide. Uh, so the question is, is the ministry making an impact on students? Yeah, I would say so. Next slide. Uh, the impact that's being made, students' lives are being changed. Go to the next slide. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> so how is the ministry funded? Uh, the ministry is funded uh, from people like you, people that are you. Uh, I am not able to do what I am able to do if it wasn't uh, for financial support from people. Literally, it is so important. I wouldn't have been able to survive these past months if it wasn't for people that supported the ministry like you support. Uh, so, you can go to the next slide. How can we help? Next slide. The goal for me is to have 200, par 200 partners uh, that do $20 a month. Now, obviously, people can do more than that. Uh, but in a moment, you guys are going to be handed this card. And on this card, it's going to ask a uh, certain question like, one, would you like to receive an administrative email letter? And then two, if you want to be a partner at $20, $40, and $60. Uh, Obviously, if you want to do more than $60, the Lord bless you. But uh, feel free, they'll hand those out. Next slide. Boom. Um, with that being said, uh, you guys can get those cards. You can drop them off at my table uh, after everything is done. But um, I want you guys to know I did not want to do that sermon here. And I had something. Totally different that was planned that I had worked on. Uh, but I think uh, right here, right now, uh, this is a time 
where we can't do this about the family of God. And my family, my hope, the reason why I do everything is my hope is there will be somebody one day that will come into a school that will let my daughters know that there are people that care about them. My hope of even this message is that one day my little girls will have to experience some of the things that I've experienced. And in order to make that happen, I need you. Thank you so much for letting me be here today. Uh, that's right. Thank you. I appreciate it.